please, uh, as we journey uh, on this journey up to Christmas, uh, we are talking about and have been for the last couple of weeks uh, beyond a story. The message of Christmas is not just about a narrative of God sending His only begotten Son to be born in the manger, but it is a narrative of redemption for all mankind. It's a narrative of God, Emmanuel, with us, how He's working in our life. And over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at a couple of testimonies of people's lives who have been impacted in the recent past. And this week, we're going to continue with that theme, and we'll look at how God not only redeems us, but then also continues to work within our life. Because he doesn't, the salvation doesn't just start at one point, although there may be a starting point where we recognize and confess Jesus Christ as Lord, but it progresses from there. While it's complete in Jesus Christ, then we grow and we experience the beauty of what is the whole goal of God. It's to restore us to right relationship with him, to return to that which we had he originally designed mankind to experience, is to walk with God. So today, I want to continue with this beyond a story. We're going to look at one more testimony, but I wanted to uh, look at Luke's gospel, chapter 2, verse 19. And I want to capture something here that we might often miss. In this account, we see the story of Mary, uh, and Mary gets a divine visit from an angel. How many know in her circumstances, a divine visit from an angel would be helpful? This is an unbelievable account, but it's a true story. It's a true account of how God was, uh, gave the, this world his son through the virgin birth, and Mary was selected, honored among women. She was selected. Now, we're going to look at the bigger story of that, but I want us to note something. At the end of this encounter with the angel and all that transpired there, she said, how can this be? Because I'm a virgin. And he said, this is of the Holy Spirit. At the end of this account, it says something in verse 19. It says that Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. She kept all these things in her heart and she thought about them often. Later in this same chapter, down uh, chapter 2, verse 51, we pick up where we left off kind of last week. And that's where they were having to... um, go forth, and we had this visit of the Magi, and, the, and we see this happening, and, the, and the, uh, uh, also what's taking place is the shepherds come there, and she's looking at all these things, and they're returning. And in verse uh, chapter 51, she, Jesus is now 12 years old. They go to Jerusalem, as they had done for many years. They are returning, and Jesus is no longer with them, so they return to Jerusalem to find Jesus teaching in the temple. And here again, it says something that's interesting in the Greek. It says, and she returned to Nazareth, with, and he returned to Nazareth, Jesus, returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. So can you imagine for a moment uh, the idea of treasuring, storing, pondering. The English word here is ponder or treasure. It's actually used in both of these verses. One is ponder, the other is treasure. But the Greek word here is the exact same word, and it literally means to place together for comparison. To place together for comparison. What Mary did was not just consider that an angel showed up to her as a virgin before she was married, Not just consider that an angel showed up to Joseph who was going to put her away quietly and told him. Not just consider that she had delivered this child, but at age 12 here again to consider all that is going on in his life. So she put these things together. She placed them together for comparison. And I want to propose to you today that as we look at the Christmas story and as we look at the testimony today that we're going to hear about in the next few moments, I want you to think about what God is doing in your life. Place it together for comparison. What has he done in the past? Begin to consider all these things. Ponder them and ponder them often. I can almost imagine Mary going about her daily business and doing the things that uh, she had to do within the day, but in the midst of doing that, kind of daydreaming, thinking about, wow, I, I remember when I visited Elizabeth and her baby leaped within the womb. It's in the account of Scripture. I remember the words she spoke and the words God gave me. I remember the angel coming. I remember Joseph, who was very disappointed in me, saying he was visited by an angel. She put all these things together, unpacked them, 
And as we look at the salvation experience and the journey in Christ, it sometimes requires us to unpack everything God is going and see a bigger picture. A few months ago, we had uh, seen Rick Dodonna, he was in the first service, was healed something that we don't often get to witness in, in that dramatic of a form, but healed of ALS. His hand straightened out. He came in in the wheelchair. He walked out. Still to this day, walking fine. The doctors are amazed. He's doing well. What does this mean? Well, you can look at one thing as miraculous as that, and we can focus on that. But what we see from Mary and the Greek here is you consider that miraculous event, and you consider the next miraculous event, and you consider all that God is doing. You unpack them and compare them together to see what the Lord has in store. Matthew chapter 12, verses 13 through 16, is about uh, the account of the Magi show up just in the verses before this. And they visit and present Jesus with these gifts. And right after that, this, this passage of Scripture takes place. And it says, After the wise men had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up. Flee to Egypt with your child and his mother. And the angel said, uh, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And that night, Joseph left Egypt. Now, it's interesting to note that because you and I are accustomed to jumping in an automobile that has headlights. Are we not? We're accustomed to having all the features of convenience, paved roads, highways, things of that nature. But they're making, he's making a long journey, and the donkey doesn't come equipped with headlights. But that very night, he didn't wait until the next morning, that very night, he loads up his wife, he loads up his child, and he departs for Egypt, a place that no good Jew in his day would have wanted to go. They came out of Egypt. Why would you want to go back to Egypt, right? Right? Consider that for a moment. There would have been no synagogue in Egypt, no place to gather the worship. He would have been so far removed from the temple, and yet he heard the voice of God, and he was responding. How is this possible? You see, the journey that goes on in our lives, it's not just one event. The day you accepted Jesus Christ, if you've done that as your Lord and Savior, that's just the beginning of a long journey, a journey that actually started before that day when God began to work in your life. As we ponder today's testimony, I want you to think about your own life. What's the Holy Spirit wanting to help you unpack and consider about your own life? And as we approach Christmas, can we see it as more than a story? Can we see it as more than one event? Can we see it as the totality of God's working in our life? How he's brought people into our life, sometimes for short seasons. How we've had experiences at an altar or in a prayer closet or doing a song at a given time where God has spoken to us in a powerful way. How we've seen God work and minister and begin to not look at one of those things, but all those things. Because this is what Mary did. Mary pondered this. Consider her assignment for a moment. Look, they were given the Son of God. That was a great honor. It was also a great burden. Think of the inconvenience this caused them. We don't see Mary and Joseph here having a gripe session with God and saying, hey, look, you gave us your only son. This was miraculous. Why can't you protect him? Why do we have to go down to Egypt? Right? No one else is that carnal. Just me. Yeah, you know, they don't have that. Why? How is it that Joseph is able to respond this quickly? Well, this didn't happen overnight. This was a journey. This was a a process of God's working in his life to prepare him for this moment. And guess what? This moment was preparation for the next moment that God would have for them. And it just builds layer upon layer, precept upon precept. I want to share one more scripture with you before we turn to the testimony. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. You know it's possible, and we'll hear this in today's testimony, it's possible to experience Christ and have God working in our life and still be missing out on some of the richness of God that's available to us. We want to unpack that and let God do everything he wants to do. But think about living this way. Let the message about Christ, it's his message, it's about him. It's not about our circumstances. It's not about our situations. It's not about our struggles. It's about him. 
Let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. You know, the only way we can have thankful hearts, the only way we can celebrate, the only way we can have joy that we sung about, uh, the only way that's possible is if we unpack and ponder all that God is doing. How could Joseph and Mary have joy when they're having to be inconvenienced, pack up their two-year-old, get on a donkey, and head down to Egypt in the middle of the night? How could they have that? Only by pondering, only by unpacking all that God was doing and seeing their current circumstances in light of God's eternal plan. At this time, we're going to hear a testimony. I was born and raised here in Louisville. At the age of 18, I met the one and only true love of my life. We were married two years later after I joined the Navy at age 20, and at the age of 22, we had the first of our four children. We have been blessed beyond measure by our God and could spend days sharing stories. Our four children and five grandchildren are rich blessings from God, and my love for my wife grows deeper every day. But it was not all easy, and there was a time of growth that took place. So a little background. Growing up, my parents were divorced when I was three. They remarried a few times, and we kids bounced back and forth between homes. As a divorce goes, it was a good one. My parents never played one against the other, and they always seemed civil to each other and loved us very much. Despite this, I experienced several moves in my young life, attending eight schools before graduating high school and starting life on my own. Now, my grandma was a big part of my growing up, and she was a faithful woman of God who prayed for me always. She used to take my sister and I to Sunday school and church whenever we went to see Dad on the weekends. So we were exposed to church, God, and Jesus, and were raised to be honest and morally good. We went to church on holidays, and for a while, when I was around 11 years old, I lived with my dad for a year, and he took us to church on a regular basis. Grandma passed away shortly after I got married, but looking back, I can see how her prayers protected me and enabled me to eventually come to Jesus. When our first child was born, I began to realize I, need, I needed to at least give her the opportunity to know about God, even though I did not know the difference between the Old and New Testaments. I shared this with my wife, and she agreed. So off we went to church. On April 4th, 1981, during a home visit by our young pastor and his wife, we both accepted Jesus. From that moment forward, God put a desire in my heart to know him. Like a baby craving milk, I craved the word of God. He revealed himself to me, and so my walk with Jesus began to grow. Things seemed to be going along well, and then the pressures of raising a family and working in corporate America grew. The stress and pressures brought some things to the surface that I never saw coming. I believe only because of my relationship with Jesus was I able to see there were issues, and he began the process of setting me free. God began to peel the issues back one at a time after he broke my heart in 1992 at a Promise Keepers conference. The process was not easy, and in fact, it was painful at times. I could not have dealt with it all at once. When it was said and done over four years or so, I was delivered from perfectionism, pride, abandonment, control, fear, and anger. I placed them in that order because they fed on one another, and when I could not control them, it led to anger. The new freedom is amazing, and I now see things in a whole new light. From what seemed to be a good American upbringing, where my parents loved me, I was never deprived of necessities, was raised to respect God, others, and to keep good morals, there were still issues that manifested when I was older that only God could deal with. I have prayed for hundreds of people over the years since then, and I realize how God uses my experiences to bless others. From misery comes ministry when we give it to Jesus. 
I'm going to invite John Jones to come up here and join me on the platform. From misery comes ministry. We often think about Mary and Joseph when we think about how spectacular it must have been to uh, be so privileged and favored of God, truly favored of God, to be considered the adopted earthly parents of the Messiah, the Son of God. But if we just note from the scripture that I read, the last one that I read about re going down to Egypt and then coming up from Egypt, they had to move a number of times. They lived not only with scorn. What? A virgin birth? That's impossible. Well, it is impossible for man, but not for God. But in addition to that scorn, they had to live with, for a season of time, the threat of, of being put to death, despised by the government. And so while it was something spectacular to be favored of the Lord, it was also challenging. And there was a lot of growth to that. So today's message uh, in testimony, as we look at it, uh, John, your life, you, you accepted Christ in 1981 at age 22, when many people often do is when they begin to ponder their children and consider where's eternity go. But you had an experience back at 11 to 12 years old. Would you share that experience? Sure. Uh, we were... Uh... Um, we went to a revival service at a high school, and I was there because I had to be there. I didn't want to be there. I was 11 or 12, and the message was given, and I don't remember anything of the message. I don't know if I even listened, but an altar call was made, and I was just compelled. It was my first experience of, of really uh, Jesus calling me, and I did not fully understand it at the time, but I knew I had to go down, so I did. went down. We then went and were given tracts and told, you know, you should pray, find a good church, uh, read the word, and that was that. And so uh, we were not regular attenders of church at the time, and, and that was pretty much that. And uh, we went on from there. So you sensed him, you, you felt, even while you weren't oh. paying attention. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was like, I, I can remember the, the steps I took. I mean, it was so real, so... I've got to go. I don't know why, but I've got to go down there. Your salvation, you, you often attribute to age 22. Mm -hmm. how, how, when did sure. that happen? Explain that for us. Well, so um, our first child was, was just a few months old, and, and we were um, uh, trying to figure out, you know, just how to deal with all the things that we were dealing with. And we realized that our daughter needed to know this, at least have the same opportunity. I made a choice, which at that time was I really hadn't followed Jesus. And I went home, Melanie agreed, so we went to a little, uh, no, actually it wasn't all that small, it was a pretty good size, uh, Baptist church there in Millington, Tennessee. And shortly within a week or two, our young pastor, and he was a young pastor, and his wife visited with us, and there in our living room, after much pondering on my part, Melanie was like, come on, let's go. So she, she accepted Jesus, and let's move on with it. And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's a big commitment, and it really was. And so when I did, I, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I mean, I invited him into my heart. And just like I said in the testimony, I began to just crave the Word. And so I was in the Word every day going forward from there. I mean, this testimony is a scratch of, of what all God's done. But that was the beginning, and that was uh, truly, I just hungered for his word. You said there was a season then, as you, you did that, you had somebody that was really helping you, mentor you at that yeah. point in time. But then you guys relocated. Tell us a little bit about that and then the journey there. Sure. So we relocated, and I didn't have any disciple. I didn't have that discipling. I was getting it when we were in that first church. And so we looked and looked. We found a little church, but just wasn't getting that same discipling. And Long and short of it, we started to drift away from the church and drift away from God. And so it got to where we weren't going to church on Sunday. And I was washing my car one Sunday on Euless Drive in Jacksonville, Florida. And the Lord spoke to my heart. I mean, I just almost similar to that other incident. It was like, wow, he was there and it was very clear I needed to choose him or be without him. And I just couldn't fathom that. So I, and again, I shared earlier in my ignorance and my arrogance, said, all right, God, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to read your word. And if I ever see any of your word not to be true, that's it. I'm finished. 
And so he's shown himself more than faithful and true. His word is always proven to be just as it says it is. You mentioned they're at your car, washing your car on a Sunday mm-hmm. morning, not in mm-hmm. a church service. Mm-hmm. A little different than your uh, 11, 12-year-old experience. You're in yep. a church service. Yep. Both times somewhat disconnected from God in the, mm-hmm. in the sense of awareness. But did you, would you say that was as vivid of an encounter as? I knew as I knew. And, and I used to actually, I used to hear Faith Gibson's father say, you know when you're knower. And uh, that's my best way to describe it. I didn't understand it at that time, but it was like, oh, that was God. I knew as I knew as I knew. So somewhat similar to Mary and Joseph. They had to know mm-hmm. that they know that mm-hmm. they know what they were doing. Joseph didn't just get up in the middle of the night and do this because he thought he had too much pizza. Right? Isn't that, is that where we go sometimes? But he knew. Yeah. He knew. Yeah. I love the fact that God meets us where we're at. Whether that be in a room, in an auditorium, even if we're not paying attention. Mm-hmm. And, 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 or whether that be out there just doing our own thing, and he just divinely shows up. Um, and I, I love that because I didn't bring that out in the first service, but mm-hmm. as you said, I was thinking, wow, that's, that's, that's a neat journey. So you said, all right, word be pr- tr- to be true. Uh, so you begin on this journey then, just continuing to pursue God, got a little bit more serious in your commitment, started going to church more. But then tell me about the yard sale experience because God was taking you deeper as well. Right. So, as, and I shared this earlier. So if you do what the Baptists teach you, read the word, pray, go to church, you're going to get exposed to God. You're going to start to know God. And so he was revealing himself to me in his word. And I began to see there was a fullness and there was much more than just the do's and the don'ts. There was a relationship and part of it included the miraculous. It included a, a, a spiritual aspect. And so as I started to inquire about that in the Baptist church, that wasn't necessarily received well. And I asked our uh, nan, what we called our nan and granddad. They somewhat adopted us, a uh, young, young couple and family. And they said, oh, no, honey, that's of the devil. And so I was like, wow, you know, well, that just made no sense to me. And I'm reading it in the Word. And so I, I pretty much was indignant about that and said, if God would do it then, why wouldn't he do it now? So I kind of went off. God's faithful, though. He began to place people around us. And again, these stories, I, I, could spend, I could spend all day just telling you what happened around that. But one of them was um, I stopped at a yard sale uh, on the way home because, again, we didn't have any money. We were just getting by, and I was always looking for something that somebody wanted to give away. <laughs> so I found these Bibles on the table, started talking to the lady. She asked if, we, if, if I knew Jesus. I said, yeah. She said, you ever heard of Pentecost? And I said, no, what's that? So she starts explaining her experience as a divorced mother, how she went to a church, how she was saved and then was prayed and filled with the Spirit. Well, she got my attention, of course, and I wanted to hear more about that. That was, again, God started to place people in my life that uh, took me closer to him and a better understanding of him. And that was, again, there were so many things. My pastor, or not my pastor, my, my barber, I started going to this barber, and he's a full gospel Assemblies of God minister. I had his Bible right behind him. He'd be cutting my hair, and he'd stop up, oh, see what God has to say, and he'd read the scripture, and then he'd get back to cutting. So, I mean, you know, it was really, really neat how God surrounded me because he knew I was pursuing him, and he met me where I was. That's a lot like the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I think of Jesus having to... Um... They, the wise men brought that, the magi brought that, but then they had to journey to Egypt, and they had to live while they were in Egypt, and the provision God put there was just the preparation for the next part of his life. And so as you kind of journeyed in this, and we're now opening yourself up to say, I, I want to grow more, I'm hungry, you're in the Word, you're praying. Um, this really took about five years before you were just filled, overflowing from this point, um, Talk to, uh, what was your wife's reaction at first? What's her feelings about you and your journey? Yeah, yeah. So her and her, si- her sister didn't live too far from us, and she'd visit on the weekends, and they just thought I was going off the deep end, right? So <laughs> she came from a, a liberal family, and she, while she believed in Jesus and all that, she thought I was kind of taking it a little bit too far. So she was kind of out on the, just, just, just supporting me because she loved me. <laughs> so... Anyway, that being said, we, I, was, I was in the Word every day, and I was pursuing God. We went to, and I didn't share this, we went to our first full gospel church we went to was a Presbyterian church down in Florida. The first service was full gospel, and so we get there, and 
we're standing, and people are praying. I mean, I mean, they were lifting up their voices to heaven, and when we realized they weren't speaking our language. We didn't know what it was. <laughs> and so that was our first experience of being around a body of believers that were expressing themselves in the spirit. So it was just, again, there were... I could spend hours telling you all the different stories. But we ended up in a little pioneering church up in um, uh, New Jersey. And uh, I was up at the altar every time there was an altar call with regard to, you know, praying for being filled with the Spirit. And so this went on for about five years. We moved down. It went on for a few years. We moved down here to Kentucky, started coming to when Trinity was just the one building over there. And my, my lovely, while I was consulting, so I was gone quite a bit, and she, she got uh, involved with the church and our three children at the time and got involved with a women's Bible study, uh, Sharon Matthews uh, led and a lot of women in the church. Anyway, so she's at that Bible study, and I'm just seeing a change. God's transforming her, and she comes home one day, and I looked at her and I said, you've been filled with the Spirit. And she said, I'm sorry, I wasn't going to tell you. So she got baptized in the Holy Spirit here. I was pursuing, pursuing. She wasn't pursuing, but she was entering into a deeper walk with God. And our God met her and filled her with, the, with his Holy Spirit. So it was kind of cool. And it was probably within six months or so after that um, uh, that, that, in fact, I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And as I've shared, I share with our kids and anyone, when you receive, you exercise the gifts of the spirit you exercise that 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 prayer language every day you pray with your mind but you pray with your spirit every day too and the lord knows i do <laughs> so the journey then really your wife receives before you're seeking all these years and, mm -hmm. and i just want to encourage you as a congregation no matter where you're at the the key component they hear in john's testimony over and over again is just pursue god mm -hmm. no matter what it is pursue god Pursue Him to be Lord of your life. Just want Him. Desire God. If you desire to journey, if you want Emmanuel, if you want God with you, He's going to show up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, He doesn't necessarily do that on our timing in the way we want it. Uh, because here's somebody who's saying, Melanie, <laughs> who's saying, I don't know about the, the, you know, I don't want to get into that crazy stuff. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, let's face it, some people are crazy. It, it's true. Mm -hmm. But God is good. And he desires, this is, goes beyond a story. It's about an indwelling of the presence of God with us. It's not just consenting to that Jesus Christ came. It's about knowing that the Almighty God walks with you and I just as he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. That physical presence, that, that dwelling spirit of the Lord with us. That's the promise. This is why we're emphasizing this Christmas season. It goes beyond a story. The Isabel's testimony, it's got to go beyond a story. It's got to come alive in you. Uh, Henry and Megan's testimony last week, it's got to come alive in you. It has to be a relationship with God. This is what he's seeking, not just the consent that God exists. Because Scripture says even the demons in hell believe that and tremble. Mm -hmm. It's not acknowledging the existence of God, but it's knowing that in addition to his existence eternally, he abides with you, Emmanuel, God with us. So that journey, you, you, you receive God's grace, the saving grace. You see him working your life even before at age 11. You, you got him visiting you at, at age 22. You have a few years later the power of God just touching your life and, and touching your wife and touching your family. But you still felt like there was unpacking that had to happen in your life mm -hmm. uh, and maybe didn't even realize it at that time. Tell That's us a little right. bit about your journey at Promise Keepers um, and how God began to deal with you sure. there. And, and, and I really feel prompted to share something here. Um, we're all different, and so God deals with us differently. Really, Melanie had a much, her heart was open. And I was, at that time, I didn't realize my heart was more closed. I was very protective. And so we're all at different places, and he deals with, I believe he gave me those experiences when I was 11 or 12, and then when I was 22, because I needed them. Uh, that peace I had when I was reading his word, because he knew I needed those to hold on to. And so he'll give us and he'll give you what you need. You may not need that. You know, you may need knocked over. And I was afraid he was going to knock me over with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I didn't want that. I wanted control. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he didn't. And um, so, yeah, so what happened, we, you know, like I say, we, we loved each other, love each other. 
loved our children and we're growing and, you know, God's moving. And so different things started to show up. You know, and very similar to most of us, things show up in our life, and it's like, well, God, why are you doing that? I'm reading every day. I'm praying every day. I go to church. You know, what's, why are you bringing this bad person in my life, or why are you bringing this situation in my life? Now I look back and realize, because he's trying to work this out of me, whatever it happens to be. And so that's, that's what started to happen. I just, you know, pressures and things were going on, and I'm struggling, and I'm praying. I'm in the Word. I'm after God. But I'm trying to deal with these things, and it started to become apparent. So we go to Promise Keepers, a group of men here from the church, and there were some here in this body that we go. And it's funny because Paul came up to He said, I didn't realize that while you were there. I said, oh, man, you, you all have no idea what happened to me while I was there. But God just showed me. He opened my eyes and showed me how hard I had become, and it was trying to control everything. So when you're hurting, your tendency is to stop the pain. And so you try and control your situation. And so out of my childhood, I didn't realize all the upheaval caused pain. And so I was trying to control my situation. And what I wasn't mean, but I was very, uh, it's my way or no way. And it was me trying to keep things in place. And so God just broke my heart for my wife and my children. I couldn't, I'm saying it now without thinking about it. So I can speak it. <laughs> the first service, I couldn't quite get it out. But uh, because he loved Melanie and my children so much, he was working on my heart, and he just broke my heart wide open. And she can tell you, I mean, I came home and I got on my knees. It was a major change, but it was a breaking. He needed to break me. And so from that time forward, I can get emotional. I, I was never an emotional man, not one that... And so up to that point, I realized there was such a hardness. And it was protection. I was just protecting myself, self-preservation. Uh, so when I gave that over to him, he started to chip away. And I, and I was like an onion. He had to peel it one at a time. I couldn't take it all at once. And I didn't know. I didn't realize what he had to work on. And so that's why I listed those things, because those were significant. And they all were things that dealt with in trying to control that situation. So you really try to control to protect yourself. Oh, absolutely. Self-preservation. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah. yeah. And you don't know it. Looking back, had I not had Jesus, I probably would have ended up divorced like, like so many other people just going in and figuring it was her fault when it was me. And, and it was because the Lord showed me. Very clearly, it, became, it came out because I was choosing Jesus and he showed me. Otherwise, we've talked about it many times. There's no way we could have survived, I don't think. But... So the journey with Christ, you know, he instantaneously redeems us. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, is a, it is a sanctification. Is, that's a big word. It just simply means we're, we're looked at as pure in God's eyes. We're made pure and right through the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's instantaneous and progressive. That is, that instantly, at the moment we confess Christ as Lord, we're forgiven. We're on our way to heaven. But it's progressive in that our mind has to catch up with what the Holy Spirit has already done yep. in our life, what Christ has already redeemed. And, and so in that process, here you are years later, and God's peeling things off, mm -hmm. big things, mm -hmm. things that you might not have even realized. Did not early realize. On. Did not realize. And, and I will say this, the, the beautiful part of it is, if you're dealing with those things, give it to God. If you're not walking in sin, he's, he's working something out in you. And uh, so that's what I've come to. So if something shows up now, I'm like, I'm okay with it. Uh, I just move on, let him do whatever he is. I'll seek him if there's something I need to, to, to deal with. But uh, yeah, God wants us to walk in all the freedom and all that he has for us. He has a plan for us. And some of us bring into that relationship things that have to be worked out. And that's, that's really the way it was with me. Once you uh, had that experience of Promise Keepers, you found it easier as you look down through the rest of your testimony in the future to come back. Those things would come back and haunt you sometimes, but you could identify them more quickly and deal with them. That oh, sure, sure. So after I really came through that about a four-year period, um, and, and this is good for anybody who's, who's found some freedom in Christ, and then you find you're, you're, you're going back to that. We've, we've, we've got testimony of healing in our hearts and in, in, in our physical being, and, and again, the enemy will come back and try and steal those things away. And so pressures can come back in. If, if you start to drift away from God and you're not walking in the spirit, you're walking in the flesh, those things can start to rise up. And Paul tells us, I mean, you know, it's an ongoing. We need to keep on, keep up the fight. 
And so, you know, yeah, that's happened where I started to get in that situation again. I, I felt some of that old stuff wanting to rise up, and I'm like, ah, okay. So guess what? I took it to prayer. I just took it and, and, and prayed in the Spirit and prayed in the Spirit and would get relief and then realize what was going on. So, you know, I was able to move on from there. But, yeah, it's uh, that's just like being in good shape. You, you get to ride that out. So if all of a sudden you're not working out, it doesn't mean you instantly lose all your muscle. Uh, and, and if you're eating well and, and you start eating bad, doesn't mean you instantly get a belly. It's a time thing. And so you can ride out all that good. And so I was riding out that anointing and stuff and, and was so busy with things, I, I then realized as I got dry what was going on. Uh, but uh, God doesn't abandon us. He's still there. And so when I recognize that, I, I turn back and, you know, he's, he's faithful. He's there for us. So when I ask you to, do this testimony. There's there's quite a bit more, and as you mentioned, there's a lot of oh, details. Yeah. But um, how was the unpacking of it for you as you began to reflect upon this? And you and Melanie talked about this. And how was the unpacking? I'm trying to capture what Mary might have experienced in that pondering Ooh. these things up in her heart that she had to consider and consider them alongside of. How was it? How do you see this journey? The unpacking part or the once we got past that? <laughs> <laughs> the unpacking and just considering the whole package oh, okay. and the orchestration of that. Well, and that's a good point. So uh, to, to kind of go along with what you're, what you're sharing there with Mary. So when I was going through those times, there were times I was like, I don't want to go through this. God, I, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to face this. But I would look back at, at the experiences I'd had with him. I'd look back at the peace he gave me that passed an understanding. I didn't share that in here. I look back and I realize, oh, he's good. I mean, he is good. And you know what? <clears throat> I've chosen you. You've been true to your word. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I've, I stuck it out. And I mean, it, it was for my relationship with Christ, but it was also for my, my wife and my children. And as I would go through those things, then I'd think I was, oh, I made it. Well, then things would start to bubble up again, different things. And, but I'd learned at that point, all right, Lord, do it, what do I need to turn loose of? And so it got easier with each one because I started to recognize, okay, you're loving me, you're disciplining me, you're teaching me, and you're showing me, and you'll give me the freedom. And so with each one, it, it took the first couple, two to the three, I didn't fully understand what was going on. And then I started to realize, ah, okay, what's up? And so I'd just go to him and I'd ask him, you know, what's up? And he'd reveal to me, and I'm like, ah, I've got to give that up. Okay, well, help me. That's the other beautiful part. I mean, I'm, I'm one. I'm a doer. I'm, I'm all about do it, do it. Well, the Lord has shown me, let me do it. Let me do it. Give it to me. And I still struggle with that. <laughs> but it's give it to me. And, and he'll do it. And, and it's, you know, again, it's giving up that control and giving it over to him. And, and in everything we do, it doesn't mean we lay down and we don't move. It simply means... We, we walk out our, our life and our walk with him, loving him, loving those he places around us. And when we struggle with things, giving it over to him. That, that helps? Yeah. That's, really, it comes down to surrender, doesn't it? Oh, gosh, yeah. Very hard for this man to do. Yeah. But he's taught me over the years. I'm, I'm pretty good about it. <laughs> I, I think that's a struggle for many of us. We may package it differently, but mm -hmm. surrendering to God and I, and I look at Mary and Joseph in that, that move to Egypt. That's what I saw in Joseph's life there. Before, he had to ponder and work through some things as God had to be speaking to him. But at that point in time, he'd, he was walking in that surrender. Because when God spoke, it was, let's load up, let's go. And, um, and we, but we, it is a journey. So it is a process where we get there, and then we can kind of falter from that, you would say. And uh, it's, God's still there with us. Yeah. Uh, but then he, we, we have to come back and rediscover that again. I just want to encourage you as a congregation today, look at your life. Unpack it. There's so much more to John's testimony, and there's so much more to your testimony. Look at your life. What has God done? Can you think of something, if, you're, if you've got a few years on you and you're past 12 years of age, can you think of something God may have done when you were younger? Can you think of something that God has done when you, maybe you were a young adult? Or maybe in your family? Or your, how many things has God done to show himself to you? And what is that telling you about what he wants to do in your life today? How he wants to guide you and lead you? 
John had mentioned the first service. I think you alluded to it here, but even provision, you were one time quite concerned about even providing a feed for your family oh, right yeah. in the early days. And, oh, yeah. and, and I know you got kind of choked up on that. Just God taught you. You didn't go into detail with that a whole lot, but he, he taught you in that moment just mm -hmm. to trust him. Mm -hmm. and he, well, and, and we spoke to it yesterday a little bit uh, with someone else. We were, this was when I was, we were first saved at 22. And literally, we did not have, the, you could see the air in our tires. We didn't have milk for the baby. We didn't have bread. We didn't have anything. And the Lord put on my heart to begin to tithe. And she really thought I'd gone off the deep because we didn't have any money. Let me tell you what, our God is so faithful. <laughs> the electric bill was nothing. Uh, we'd get money in the mail. I mean, it was, I, if you've never, Tithe, don't do it because I'm saying, but just look at God's word. And let me tell you what, he is faithful. And so we didn't, like I said, we didn't have anything he provided for us. It was crazy. But our God is awesome is all I can say. There's a song, and, and, it, and we, we won't go into this, but uh, a song that came out years ago, uh, Look What the Lord Has Done. I think it came out of the Brownsville Revival. Mm -hmm. Look What the Lord Has Done. When you consider the Christmas story, it's not... It's his story. But remember, his story is being written over top of your story. And he's always intended to weave the two together. It's always been God's attention. Everyone in this room, everyone who has ever breathed, every life that was ever knit together in their mother's womb, it was God's absolute intention to be with and to write a story, not of your life and God over here, but write a story of our lives woven together with the working of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, even like in John's testimony, we don't see exactly what God is doing or understand the incredible significance of a given moment that we will later, we'll understand that there's an old hymn, we'll understand it better by and by. That is God's gift to us. As you consider the birth of Christ this Christmas season, I want you to consider it's with you in mind. Consider, unpack all that God has done. Lay it out on your table. Write it down. Weigh through that and consider, put it together as, as Mary uh, mentioned, to consider alongside of. So what's happening in your life today Consider that alongside of the many things that God has already done in your life. And in that, I believe you'll find the strength and the joy that Christ came to give every single one of us. A joy of relationship. Emmanuel, God with us. When John taught anything, you did, you did, you did wonderful in the first service, but you got choked up a little bit more as you got to some of those it things. tough. This is the way it should be, though. Yeah. It, it really is, isn't it, John? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Guys, if, mm -hmm. if the story of Christ in your life doesn't reach to your depth of your heart, you're not experiencing all that God has for you. You're missing something. And the good news is you might be checked out washing your car in a driveway, but I want to guarantee you Jesus can still speak to you. And he as much wants to get a hold of your heart as anyone else is in the room. And it's not about your worthiness. It's not about all the things you've done right or all the things you've done wrong. It's about his incredible love for each and every one of us. And this love is an opportunity to be transformed. Not to live with just a knowledge one of my greatest fears is too many people are walking around saying, I'm a Christian because they have a knowledge that Jesus Christ existed. They have a knowledge that he is, and they kind of accept that as a fact. But you know, there's, it's more than a story. It's a relationship, as John has said. It's available to each one of us. Let's stand to our feet together.